Uh, uh, hi all, my name is Augusto Ribeiro. I'm the coordinator of documentation and information unit at the University of Porto. Me and my colleague Manuel Montenegro, uh, we are assigned to support and moderate this session. Uh, we expect the session will be very valuable for all. Um, and I, I want to say to you that you must submit all the questions uh, in the Q&A tab uh, in the right of your screen, and uh, we submit them at the end to the panelists. Uh, the first presentation, uh, libraries as research partners in interdisciplinary research teams, uh, is presented by Kelly Miller and Kinneret ben Benan. Um, the introductions um, will be done during the presentations by uh, uh, the panelists. So, please, Kelly, the floor is yours, and Kinneret. Thank you. Thank you, and good day, everyone. I'll share my screen for the recording. Just a second. My name is Kelly Miller, and I'm the Associate Dean for Learning and Research Services at the University of Miami Libraries in Miami, Florida, in the United States. And I'm Kinar Ben-Knan, I'm the Research and Assessment Librarian here at the University of Miami Libraries. Today, Kinar and I will discuss the roles and contributions that librarians can make on interdisciplinary research teams and how to support them in this work. Before we dive into our topic, we'll share a few facts about the University of Miami. The university is a private, secular, not-for-profit, research one institution located on three separate campuses, including a downtown medical campus, a central campus, and a marine and atmospheric science research campus. We have seven libraries that support 11 schools and colleges, and our population includes 17,000 students and 16,000 faculty and staff members. In the last several decades, li librarianship has been adapting to meet the changing needs of the 21st century research enterprise by building expertise in areas such as scholarly communication, data management, and digital scholarship. A new area of exploration is the role that librarians can play on interdisciplinary research teams. The program that we'll describe today is based on a collaboration between the University of Miami's Office of the Vice Provost for Research and the UM Libraries. The seed of the collaboration was planted when Susan Morgan, the former Associate Provost for Research and a professor in the School of Communication, came to the libraries in the fall of 2018 to discuss possibilities for collaborating around a new strategic initiative called Newlink that the university was launching. In our conversation, Susan described some of the key questions her office was asking. They included, how can the university help create solutions to global problems or grand challenges? And what do researchers on these teams need to be successful? As I listened to Susan, I wondered, how might librarians contribute? And could this be an opportunity for subject librarians to participate in the research process in new ways, maybe to experiment with new roles? The new strategic initiative that the Office of Research uh, was about to launch was called uh, the University's Laboratory for Integrative Knowledge Initiative, or also known as ULINK. The goal of this program is to contribute to addressing compelling or compelling global problems through interdisciplinary inquiry. Teams of scholars from multiple disciplines receive funding to pursue solutions to problems that they identify as a team. As Susan talked about what the university leadership hoped that these teams might accomplish, I suggested to Susan the idea that librarians might join the teams to learn and provide support. She liked the idea and suggested that we try it. As a result of this strategic conversation, librarians have been part of the social infrastructure of the Ulink program since its beginnings. In the first three years of the program, as a requirement, librarians were embedded on each of the award-winning teams. This opportunity to be included in the grant program in this way has provided librarians with direct knowledge of the needs and demands of interdisciplinary researchers. So here's an overview of the vision for the new link program and its key elements. Uh, interestingly, so funding for the research teams is provided in several phases. 
The first phase offers funding for teams to develop their concept while team building, and the second phase provides funds for the teams to begin implementation of the experiment or project. And in these first three years of the program, science of team science training was provided for research teams. So what is science of team science? Science of team science involves evidence-based guidance and training for collaborative research teams engaged in solving complex problems. And it's a new emerging field in and of itself. But overall, the U-Link program is designed to offer a variety of ways to support the teams in their growth and development, including by offering spaces for teams to gather in the UM libraries. The U-Link program has funded more than a dozen interdisciplinary research teams in these first three years. This is a chart showing each of the three rounds of phase one funding. You can see the topics, the names of the librarians, and the different disciplinary schools represented. Topics of the research uh, projects included climate change, online extremism, and criminal justice reform, among others. Faculty participants were drawn from across the university's 11 disciplinary schools, and uh, 11 librarians were involved as team members in this first three-year period. And some teams have gone on to receive external grant funding. So at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Kinneret, who's going to talk about assessment. Thank you, Kelly. So in 2018 and 2019, we conducted surveys and focus groups to learn about the librarians' experience on their team. We wanted to know about their roles, benefits to the teams, challenges, now the library can better support the librarian. To examine these questions, we developed an open-ended survey instrument distributed annually to librarians who participated in this program. In addition, a semi-structured focus group with 11 new link librarians was also con conducted. The focus groups led to an open and enriching dialogue that lasted about two hours. It was extremely valuable and supplemented our understanding of the survey results. As a result of the assessment, we found that librarians contribute to interdisciplinary research teams in diverse ways, but that their contribution clustered around three main areas. The first one, finding and accessing information resources across disciplines. The second, connecting teams to experts and resources. And the third one, improving collaboration and communication strategies. The first area is not surprising, but the second two are particularly interesting and promising. Librarians are serving as connectors and also serving to help the team cohere and engage more meaningfully. To give specific examples, one librarian conducted extensive literature searches for her team, another uh, connected her team to new community stakeholders, and then another identified project collaboration software and managed the research through that software for his team. In our assessment, we also identified challenges and barriers to successful partnerships between librarians and research teams that are important to note. Uh, in the focus groups we, that we conducted, several librarians expressed frustration over the level of inclusion on their teams. Some mentioned the need to determine clearer expectations for the role of the librarians. We learned that each librarian comes with a different to their teams with different expertise and skill set. Librarians also discussed the differences between themselves and other faculty team members regarding compensation, shared authorship, and grants. Lack of confidence uh, in their own ability and skills to participate in our research teams was another issue we discussed. However, we noticed that concerns related to self-confidence often faded once librarians gain more experience on their teams. With these findings, we were able to refine our description of U-Link Librarians program to educate faculty members applying for U-Link grants about the beneficial role that librarians can play on the teams. On this brochure distributed to faculty, librarians are quoted uh, about how they contributed to their teams in previous rounds by connecting their teams to community stakeholders, conducting extensive literature searches, and identifying and managing project collaboration software for their teams. In 2020, 
we also developed a set of survey questions to gain insight from the research faculties, from faculty that are not, not librarians, about their views of librarians' involvement on the team. We ask faculty questions like if they understand clearly the librarians' responsibilities and expertise on the, their teams, how do teams benefit from librarians' involvement, and whether their perception about them have changed over time. We also wanted to know faculty views on what might hinder the involvement of librarians on ULIN. Representatives from 11 out of 17 ULIN teams have responded to our survey, a total of 33 participants. Librarians did not receive this portion of the survey. Selected open-ended comments are shown here in these slides. And they confirmed what we found from serving uh, our librarians and also from the focus groups we conducted. On some teams, librarians are serving as full team members, adding to the cognitive diversity of the teams, helping bridge gaps between skill sets and helping to develop common language that crosses boundaries between disciplines. At the same time, it is important to note that not all faculty reported successful integration with their librarians, just as librarians themselves noted. Uh, some also wished for a clearer, uh, ex uh, for a clearer um, a definition about what librarians can, can do for their teams. So the fact that the results varied uh, showed that we are challenging current definitions of librarianship in this experiment. Indeed, librarians have been called pioneers by university administrators who designed the U-Link program. Dr. John Bixby, our former vice provost for research, confessed in this local news story that initially he didn't expect the librarians to become such important U-Link partners. But he said, our teams have reported that the librarians have become a critical aspect of their team. As a result of the three-year U-Link experience, we believe that emerging role for librarians in interdisciplinary research might be as integration specialists or a cultural translators. In, in the context of science of team science, prior research studies have examined the role of adding a knowledge bridging collaborators, such as librarians to scientific teams. One study indicated that participation of a bridge builder or a knowledge broker such as librarians, contributed to the integration of successful teams. Librarians who know how to ask questions about disciplines other than their own can serve as integration specialists, especially with their unique skill sets and broad vantage points. Librarians can help teams address some of the most common challenges they face, including how to manage large teams, navigate difficulties communicating with team members, uh, and find common language with which to address the proposed problem. Another way to describe the role of librarians might be cultural translator, uh, translators, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, who are necessary for breaking down silos of all sorts, in this case, between disciplines and for the benefits of society. So how do we adapt to link program in light uh, in light of our uh, what we learn from our assessment, we plan to communicate the flexible role of librarians on interdisciplinary research teams, explore mechanisms for determining the right match of librarians with teams, and be conscious, be conscious about institutional and structural barriers. Support professional development and training for librarians would be our priority. So what type of professional development training might help librarians serve as integration specialists or cultural translators? So drawing on the emerging field of the science of team science, such professional development opportunities may include programs focused on topics like team communication, team brainstorming, um, collaboration tools, or community engagement strategies. In this coming year, we hope to offer some professional development training opportunities on these topics for both librarians and researchers. So uh, in addition, in the coming year, uh, we'll be continuing our collaboration with our new Vice Provost for Research, Dr. Aaron Kovetz, 
uh, and we'll uh, be doing a number of things that uh, are outlined here on this slide, um, including uh, piloting the uh, professional development opportunities uh, on sort of within the space that we imagine may become a future faculty research commons in Richter Library. But in conclusion, we think that by increasing familiarity with team science, subject librarians, liaison librarians might expand the relevance and impact of their positions. In our experiment at the University of Miami, librarians have shown that they are able to participate on research teams. They've shown that they can help advance solutions to pressing global problems and deepen libra library support for the research enterprise overall. It's also possible that entirely new positions focused solely on interdisciplinary research could emerge as a result of this type of experimentation. Just as libraries have developed positions focused on digital scholarship over the past two decades, libraries could find it necessary now to create new positions dedicated to advancing interdisciplinary research. In this way, libraries could potentially help their universities build stronger, more effective research networks on campus and pursue needed solutions to complex global issues that are facing all of us. At the University of Miami, we look forward to continuing to explore uh, how the library can support interdisciplinary research. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. If you have comments or questions, please connect with us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly and Kinneret. Uh, for this great presentation. Um, I don't see any question um, in the Q&A tab. Um, so maybe uh, we can proceed. Um, I want to thank you for this perspective of uh, uh, a new approach to uh, mm -hmm to increase uh, and to adapt uh, the skills of librarians, the basic skills, the, what, and uh, to keep in what they know to do better and uh, move it to a digital environment that is growing up very fast. And we need uh, really to readapt and, uh, and, uh, and, trans and keep moving our skills to, to the new environments. So thank you very much. Thank and uh, we go now for the, um, the second presentation. The second presentation, reimagining the spaces at research libraries during the most challenged time, um, is presented by uh, Shelly Shang. Uh, Shelly Shang is Dean of Libraries and Professor at Auburn University in the United States since 2019. Prior to that, she was the Dean and Professor at Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library, University of Montana. In both positions, Dr. Shang is responsible for providing leadership and management for the libraries and in, advanced, and in advancing the library's central role in the educational research and service mission of the university. Dr. Shang, uh, shares the IFLA Journal Editorial, Editorial Committee and the, the member of the committee. Uh, she is currently serving of American Library Association's Presidential Advisory Committee for the other incoming president, Patty Wang. So uh, pre please, Dr. Shelley, the floor is yours. Dr. Shelley. So uh, something. Something is going wrong. This is. I'm not seeing Dr. Shelley. Dr. Shelley, she's uh, not. She's not here. She's not in the backstage. To please uh, change to the 
the third presentation okay. and I'll, I'll see what happens. Okay, so we jump for the third presentation. Uh, the th uh, Jeffrey, uh, you don't mind of that? I'm fine. Okay, so we'll, we will proceed. Um, uh, the, the third presentation, Fostering Innovation in the Libraries Experiential Studio, uh, is presented by Jeffrey Pelliston uh, from uh, the... Sorry, I missed something here. From the Brigham uh, Young University, I also have some problems with my with my computer. Are you there? I am here. Only the two of us. Strange. Are you ready for me to share my screen? Yes. Um, okay. Um, Jeffrey, uh, you can proceed, please. Uh, Good. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm serving currently as the Senior Associate University Librarian at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah in the United States. I have uh, the library building, our assessment program, and personnel under my direction. I appreciate being able to present this afternoon on fostering innovation in the library's experiential studio. And this presentation, I believe, fits well into the conference themes of library spaces and services, advancing innovation and engagement, and partnerships with communities, local and global. Um, I'm having a hard time, there we go. Over the next few minutes, I will introduce you to BYU, provide a chronology of the library's experiential studio, discuss the transformation of the studio from a pilot uh, to a permanent space, um, share three different collaborative projects that have taken place in the studio, and then give some illustrative examples of student reactions about their experiences to taking classes in this space. BYU is a faith-based institution sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Carnegie classification of the institution is R2, which stands for Doctoral University's High Research Activity. However, we see ourselves primarily as an undergraduate teaching institution, and you'll see why when the next slide comes up. Uh, we, like the University of Miami, are divided into 11 different colleges. Our library is designed to serve all of those students, but it pr primarily serves students in 10 of them, since we do have a law school which has its own library. Here are some facts and figures about BYU. Most importantly, we have just over 36,000 students and 92% of them are undergraduate students studying in 186 undergraduate majors, but the 8% roughly of graduate students we have are in 64 master's programs and 26 doctoral programs. Our students come from all 50 states of the United States and from more than 100 uh, foreign countries. Important points in the chronology of our experiential studio include those shown here. Uh, in 2012, a diverse group of faculty from across the university formed a Creativity, Innovation, and Design, or CID group, under the aegis of the university's faculty center. And the common interests that brought these faculties together included um, interdisciplinary teaching and learning based on project work. In March of 2013, BYU hired the late Jennifer Postenbaugh as the new university librarian. And in August of that year, two of the members of the CID group approached Dr. Postenbaugh and asked her about uh, the possibility of creating a space within the library for interdisciplinary classes to be held. They purposely picked the library 
because it serves and in a sense is owned by uh, all students regardless of their discipline. Dr. Postenbaugh was open to the idea and discussions proceeded. Over the next couple of months, they came to fruition and a decision was made to open what was called the CID Studio. That happened in February of 2014 in a roughly 1,300 square foot or 121 square meter space. The space was managed by an informal group composed of several CID group members and two library employees, including myself. Basic principles at the outset included the following. The classes should involve students from more than one major and preferably faculty from more than one discipline would teach those classes. A librarian would be involved in each of the classes and the classes would be project-based leading toward a solution to a social problem. And those uh, classes would also be based on design thinking. In September, 2015, that informal governance group uh, was superseded by a formally charged governance group, but it still involved teaching faculty, many from the CID group and some librarians as well. The formal group chose to retain some, but not all of the earlier ideas. They also regularized the processes for evaluating faculty applications to teach in the CID studio. And based on feedback that they had received already from instructors who had used the prototype space, the governance group began formulating plans for a, uh, an expansion in a more permanent space. The library received university approval in late 2016 to create such a space, provided that we could identify donor funding to pay for it and that the expansion had to be completed by the end of 2019. Funding was secured in time for construction on the expansion to begin in July of 2019 and the space renamed the Experiential Studio, opened in January of 2020. As mentioned, most of the classes in the studio use a design thinking methodology to pursue projects that are being worked on by the classes. The studio itself is a product of this methodology. The CID studio was the prototype and the Experiential Studio is a result of what was learned in that prototype. CID group members, in their prior experiences trying to do project-based learning in an interdisciplinary fashion in other places around campus called for a large group instruction and workspace. Flexibility of setup and in, in this, uh, these photos that you can see, there's a variety of furniture, most of it very easily moved, some rolling stools, some fixed chairs, but also not so heavy that they couldn't be moved around. Um, lots of whiteboards. There are even whiteboards that you can't see and portable whiteboards that were made available. They also needed breakout spaces and those two open doorways that you see in the picture to the upper left are to breakout rooms and there was a breakout room not seen in this photo as well. Um, they also wanted ready availability of materials that would uh, facilitate the creation of low fidelity prototypes. And you can barely see at the edge of that upper left photo um, the drawers of an old card catalog cabinet. Those drawers, and there are quite a number of them that you can't see, were filled with these kinds of materials, as well as some other um, furniture and, and larger drawers that had such things. Here is a picture of the large group instruction space from the new experiential studio. All of the things that we talked about or that I talked about from the previous slide were carried over. And you can see that there is a, a large amount of display technology that's been added to this space that didn't exist in the prototype studio. While those displays are pushed up against the ceiling, everyone can be pulled down to table level so they can move up and down as needed to either cover or expose the whiteboards. The glass doors in the upper right of this photo lead to a low fidelity maker space and project storage room. And those at the upper left lead to a breakout room. The entrance to a second breakout room at the lower left isn't visible in this photo. These two pictures are of the low fidelity maker space. The one on the left shows lockable project storage cabinets as well as supply storage and an adjustable height work table. On the wall opposite to this that isn't seen in the photo, there's more shelving for both project and supply storage. The photo on the right shows additional supplies and tools including a printer, paper cutter, hole punch, staplers, and so forth. This slide shows the two breakout rooms. 
you can see sliding glass doors that can close the breakout rooms uh, from the instructional space and they're visible in both the upper right and the lower left uh, photos. The upper right photo shows a conference or presentation style break room, and you can also see an exterior entrance to that room to the left of the windows. The bottom pictures are of the same room. Um, the one on the left shows just inside the large group instructional space, and if you were to walk through that, turn to the right, you would see the rest of that room in the photo on the lower right. There is also an exterior entrance to this breakout room. It's not visible, but is just inside that uh, glass door to the left. The use of the CID studio showed that sometimes the breakout rooms weren't being used when a class was being held, but there were students who wanted to use the breakout rooms. And so as the new studio was designed, we wanted both interior and exterior entrances to those rooms. And now to some of the collaborations. Uh, the first illustrative project was a collaboration between the library and a Technology 312 class, which is better known as an innovation boot camp. The course instructor asked me, does the library have a project that my class can work on? And gratefully, we did. We asked that they help us design new individual study carols to replace carols like the one shown in this photo. At the time the class took place, these carols were nearly 40 years old, and while they had served us well, as we were doing deeper cleaning, we found that many of the legs were breaking off, as well as them, frankly, being too small for everything that uh, students carry in this day and age. The instructor divided his class into three different teams, and they employed the user's design thinking methodology to come up with prototype carols. Um, the two photos in this picture uh, show some lo-fi prototypes of carols, both of them sharing a, a shelf, high walls on the side carried over from the old carol, but you can see in the photo to the right, a chair, uh, a Lego chair with wheels on it. The pictures at the bottom of this slide come from one of the design teams, and you'll see one with a chair, again with wheels, but lots of other uh, movement options for that chair. The, or the, the drawing on the left shows a footrest, an adjustable height desktop, and still the shelf, and again, those high walls. The two drawings at the top are from uh, the third team, and you can see, again, a chair with wheels. This one has the shelf, the high walls, but also includes an innovative L-shaped desktop. All of the teams suggested that the carols did need to be larger to accommodate not just the books and notebooks of yesteryear and of today, but also the laptops and tablet computers and other things that students carry with them. This shows the old carol and its replacement side by side. Barely visible behind that wheeled swivel chair on the floor is a footrest. The L-shaped desktop was incorporated, the shelf was retained, the higher walls and the larger carol all came out. Plus we added a whiteboard and both standard and electric, excuse me, USB uh, plugs for students to be able to charge their devices. And about 10% of our carols were manufactured for left-handed students with 90% being manufactured for right-handed students. It proved to be a very successful collaboration. Expanding to the national level, more than one BYU Information Technology 515R, and the, the title for that class is Special Topics in IT. Um, these classes collaborated on a project funded by the United States' National Science Foundation to develop an alternate reality game to help spark interest in the STEM disciplines or science, technology, engineering, and math, particularly for 13 to 17 year old teens and with an emphasis there on minority teens. Collaborators included the University of Maryland, the United States' National Aeronautics and Space Administration or NASA, Tinder Transmedia, which was a Provo-based media company, and middle school students in both Washington, D.C. and Provo. Students in those locations actually served as team members helping with the design of the game. There were uh, middle school students in other locations who served as beta testers throughout the, the design process. This is a visual of the game, which was called Dust. And the name comes from the game's premise, a dust that blankets the country and causes all of the adults to go into a coma-like state. The players in the game needed to collaborate with one another to figure out how to counter out, counteract the effects of the dust. And for those interested, 
the URL at the bottom of the screen um, is an archived version of the trailer about this game on the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. Dust was played by more than 2,000 teens over the course of seven weeks in the first quarter of 2015, and later the team released a replayable version of the game so that teachers could use it in their classrooms uh, with eight or more students. The replayable version consisted of 10 different modules, each taking about 60 minutes to complete. The collaborators in the project developed the storyline for the game, its graphics, the game artifacts, uh, other visuals, and set the soundtrack for it, among other things. In a Fine Arts 301R, or Creative Collaboration Arts and Communications class, faculty from BYU's Melvin J. Ballard Center for Economic Self-Reliance and the Laycock Center for Creative Collaboration uh, worked with the Fundacion Paraguaya, founded by Martin Burt, to create what is known as the Poverty Stoplight. This involved creating a tablet-based app that allowed the gathering of detailed information at the household level in Paraguay to identify the level of poverty being experienced by a family. Uh, it was done across 50 indicators, which collectively uh, covered six different dimensions. For each of those 50 indicators, the family would respond to a series of three pictures, one red, one yellow, and one green. Identifying most closely with the red picture indicated extreme poverty, yellow indicated poverty, and green indicated no poverty. And the family could then use their personal stoplight uh, to make a plan about how to move from red to yellow and yellow to green. At the same time, organizations could see data from families in a particular area and spot trends that might help them to develop uh, helpful interventions on a broader scale. These photos come from a movie created for Fundacion Paraguaya by students in BYU's Laycock Center as part of this whole collaboration. And they show that this woman has been able to improve her situation across five of the six dimensions, uh, moving those from red to either yellow or green. Overall, uh, an app for the Android smartphones has now been developed in a richer suite of web-based applications help partner organizations. Um, and they number at this point 423 such organizations in 36 different countries. According to Poverty Stoplight's website in Paraguay, 6,000 families surpassed all 50 indicators of poverty and managed to turn green all of the yellows and reds on their stoplights. And 30,000 of families in that country overcame poverty in terms of income generation. Finally, here uh, are some representative reactions from students about the classes that they took in either the CID and or the experiential studios. They're representative of other kinds of uh, reactions that we have received. We in the library field of the studio has been a significant success and are pleased to continue to be involved both with librarians in the classes and in housing the studio in a space that's been described as academic Switzerland, uh, neutral with respect to disciplines. Everybody is either equally at home or equally not at home in the library. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we, we have one question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it is wonderful that the library was able to work with faculty who teach multidisciplinary courses. Did you have to find these courses or how did it happen? We did not have to find the courses. The courses found us. And over the course of time, um, since the studio has been opened, we have probably, I, I don't remember the exact count, but we've had more than um, 50 different courses from virtually every college except law um, that have come in and used and taught in the studio. So they came to us. We didn't have to uh, find them. There was actually quite a bit of interdisciplinary teaching going on even before the studio opened, but they were finding that business students didn't like going to the engineering building and the engineering students didn't like going to the humanities building. And so finding a, a place that was neutral um, was, was the real attractiveness of the library. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, we need to go on. Um, uh, Dr. Shelley, uh, Shelley Shang is already here. So we can proceed uh, with the second presentation. 
uh, the title of the presentation is Reimagine the Spaces at Research Libraries During the Most Challenged Time. Uh, Shelly Shang is the Dean of, of Libraries and professor, professor at Auburn uh, University in the United States since uh, 2019. Um, prior to that, she was Dean and Professor at Maureen and Mikey Mansfield Library, University of Montana. In both positions, Dr. Shang is responsible for providing leadership and management for libraries and in advancing the library's central role of the institutional research and service mission uh, of the university. Uh, Dr. Shang shares the IFLA Journal Editorial Committee and, the member of, and is member of the committee. Uh, she is currently serves uh, the American Libraries Association as Presidential Advisory Committee for uh, the incoming President Patty Wang. So you can proceed, this floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Really, I'm really happy to join this conference my first time. So I um, really want to learn many new, many things new from my colleagues here. And uh, let me share screen. Uh, yeah, the, uh, this is my uh, uh, my presentation title today. Um, as a, a, a moderator in, already introduced me, I'm from. Uh, uh, try to move on. Yeah, with uh, Alabama, the uh, United States is huge, and uh, Auburn University is on the east side of Alabama. Uh, in the United States. And Auburn University is one of the uh, nation's uh, public land grant institution. Uh, each year we have this, uh, 30, over 30,000 students. In 2020, Auburn University was ranked 44th among the public universities in the US and also in 2020, our university went on the research profile, went, uh, went to high level from a 100, top 100 to 105, 100, from top 110 to top 105, so five, uh, in, the five num in the number rank. Also that um, um, libraries, uh, uh, university library is among the top 125 university libraries that a membership with the membership of uh, uh, Association for Research Libraries in the United States. In 90, uh, in 29, 20, uh, in two years, three years, actually three years ago, the library developed a strategic plan, 2019-2024, uh, 2024, that supports university's strategic plan. And our library is actually in library, uh, our library in, uh, started the, uh, early 2020 when we started to implement uh, our strategic plan. Uh, all, everybody know that the summer uh, pandemic hit the country, hit the state and our campus. Uh, during that period of time, as in many places, uh, the buildings, the campus buildings, the libraries closed, uh, socially distanced uh, operations become looks like every day's life during that period of time. Oops. Uh, during that time, even university libraries closed, but still uh, each library department still have some people take turn to uh, come into library to make sure that essential services and uh, also deliverers, deliveries and other things were worked. Uh, we realized we have uh, during that part because it's unprecedented 
we have to first understand the needs of faculty, uh, including professors, uh, researchers, and graduate students, what they really need during those difficult times. That we learned that they want more access, they want more resources to be accessible remotely. Anything online, ebooks, e journals, and other electronic materials. Also, they want access more uh, more high high level technologies, even outside the library, outside the building. They want to make sure they have access to. We have find a special way to connect with them. Uh, they need a very far continual need focus on the services, uh, especially related to data services, data management, and in of course increase the collections. Uh, it's a something different from our other libraries. That means our libraries re actually reopen in summer 2020. That gave us a time to prepare for the full reopen in fall last year uh, to, um, to help our students. Uh, with many restrictions during that period of time, we need to focus on the research services and support. Uh, our strategy, our strategy included that we continue alignment with library's strategic priorities. And also we want to ensure the organizational alignment and uh, give us that give us time and opportunity to plan, design and implement a new library facility. Right now we call the innovation and research commons. Also, we need to figure out during that period of time, uh, what kind of services and the programs we are offering through this new facility. Uh, here's a quickly few uh, highlights related to our strategic priorities. Uh, a total of the five strategic priorities, including student success, research support, communication, uh, learning space, and organizational excellence. But uh, we take advantage of last year and fully focus on the uh, strategic priority go to that research support, meaning that uh, uh, develop the all uh, a set of services and the programs that support our research, uh, campus research. We also, uh, during that period of time, uh, we also want to make sure that uh, we have organizational alignment that support our prior priorities. For example, in summer, uh, in summer 2019, the library established the research support and the partnership working group that including librarian, librarians from all the subject area and the campus uh, uh, units representative in that team. Uh, in January 2019, in January 2020, just the prior to a pandemic, uh, the libraries, we established a new department called the Research Support Department mm -hmm. to gear the library's efforts to support research and services. Uh, we also want to continue our efforts to work with other campus units to be partnership with other unit mm -hmm. groups. One of the groups called Associate Deans for Research, that's a campus-wide uh, group. Each college would have one Associate Dean for research in that group. So libraries will continue uh, to represent us in that group and to host a variety of meetings with that group. Uh, again, as I mentioned, during the lockdown, um, campus closing and the summer slow student, uh, uh, student uh, movement, we took advantage to renovate um, this uh, space within the library. Uh, used to be occupied by shelves and other uh, other uh, other facilities, but uh, we took advantage of that entire summer to complete this uh, uh, renovation project. Here are some of uh, currently uh, we provide services since last fall uh, fall semester. Uh, 
current service including makerspace, VR, AR, data space, uh, Adobe Creative, uh, technology lending, audio studio, remote work uh, workstation access. Uh, remote work remote workstation remote workstation access means a student can still remotely access to the high end workstations that's with lots of softwares. So, so we figured a way to do that. Uh, also liquid galaxy digital wall display. Um, in addition to those facilities, we also in this space offer the, those uh, some uh, programs services in such as uh, workshops and uh, uh, conference gathering uh, plus consultations. Those are 12 areas in those space. Uh, even we opened up this uh, facility just last fall. We are we are they uh, we have already seen the, uh, some outcomes, uh, such as uh, Adobe Creative Space conduct in person virtual group and workshops that really will come by faculty and students. Uh, Makerspace we already have used a three D printing job for three D print job for Cambridge students and faculty, plus audio videos and the data space. Uh, we provide training and the consultation for faculty students, uh, especially graduate students. Any questions, any uh, support they need, they come to this place for uh, for assistance. Uh, Liquid Galaxy. Uh, that was very heavily used by classroom faculty and by research faculty, especially for their uh, academic. They bring sometimes they bring class, sometimes they bring them workshops in that space. Shall we? Uh, we have three more minutes. So. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> Next step. Uh, we'll continue evolving and expanding the services and programs uh, because uh, technology change, we need to keep up with that change. Uh, especially we'll continue, uh, want to make sure we address the needs of campus, just not sometimes easy to follow the trend, but uh, local resources are always not uh, that abandoned. So we have to uh, really look at the, our campus needs about um, what we wanted to uh, develop them. Uh, of course, some challenges continue to be there, uh, especially a new situation. Uh, even our campus majority of, uh, people <laughs> get vac uh, vaccine, but we still e every day heard here and there the cases come up. Also, we realize the hybrid formats to access research support and service may become a norm, a new norm. So that's another uh, area we need to focus on that. Uh, finally, we really need to continue uh, looking at what's the best, what's the best technology that serve our campus that can, so we can bring. In. With that, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, this is a one minute thing I properly just to quickly show you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelley, for sharing this with us, your, your experience with us. Um, uh, we don't have any question here. Uh, so uh, maybe we can end this session. I, I will apologize. I apologize for all the technical issues that we that we that we had. Uh, also apologize to Jeffrey because uh, I the the present the introduction that he shared uh, he shared with me get lost in my in my words. So. But uh, what is important uh, at the end is the contribution that you all give to this uh, to this conference, and uh, I I hope everyone enjoy it. Uh, and thank you very much for being, for being here. Thank you also to to the audience for for attending this session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.